So I'm going to make this short and sweet because John said to. John Kalaki served two terms in the Vermont House of Representatives. I'm sure most of you know who he is. Uh -huh. Previously, he was executive director of the Flynn Center. If you went to the Flynn, you know who he is. And then Sean Clute received a Master of Fine Arts degree from Mills College. That's in California, right? Yeah. He is currently a professor of fine and performing arts at Vermont State College, the Johnson campus, and also serves on the board of the Vermont Arts Council. Welcome, please, Sean and John. Well, thank, thank you very much all for coming. I, I'm John, and this is Sean. And uh, we, we collaborated on a video that we're going to show you at the end of our talk. And it was actually on uh, Vermont PBS last week. And so Sean's mother felt he was validated as an artist because he was on PBS. So <laughs> anyway. The, um, the last time I spoke here was a few years ago, and it was on pivot points in classical dance uh, in the 20th century. So that was classicism. Uh, today we're going to talk about the avant-garde in the 1960s. So pretend you're laying on the floor, and you're looking at the ceiling. and we're, So we're going to talk about artists who were changing all the norms in the 60s, and, and they were called fluxes. It was a, a movement that was brief. And we're going to describe it, and then we're going to show you a video made of it, and then we'll, we'll talk. I have over there um, some catalogs uh, from different museums that have done fluxus uh, exhibitions, because it's a little hard to understand what some of these people made. So please feel free if you'd like to afterwards. And then in the back, I had a book come out last year, so if you want to get a copy of that, I'd be glad to sign it. But anyway. Um, so. I really loved the Fluxus movement. It, it really began in the early 60s in, in New York, and it really came out of uh, the Dada movement, which was in the 1920s in Europe, and they used um, photographs and typography and cheap uh, copying stuff, and it was all political. It was anti-establishment, and they were using concrete poetry, and performances and stuff, and that was happening then. And then Marcel Duchamp comes along. And do you remember, uh, I think it was in the art fair in 1917, um, he put a urinal in the art show and signed it, Our Mutt. But he didn't tell anyone that he had done that. So of course, all the people were like, what is, this is just a porcelain urinal. How is that art? And he, he was just being Marcel Duchamp. He wasn't being our mutt. He said, well, it's signed by an artist, so I, I, I think it's art, isn't it? Shouldn't we just? <laughs> and we're all having such a great, great debate about it. That's the point of art, OK? It's OK to keep it in. And of course, then he had to admit that it was his. Um, anyway, and he went on and did things where he turned bicycles upside down and made those ready-made sculptures and stuff. And so he was really questioning the authority of an artist. Okay, and what that was about. And then uh, 20 years later comes John Cage, and he was a big fan of Marcel Duchamp, and they actually used to play chess together. Uh, apparently they didn't talk much, but they played chess <laughs> regularly. Um, and John Cage did something rather radical in the uh, 50s, where he did a composition called 4.33. And David Tudor came out on, on stage uh, with the piano, opened up the music, and sat there in silence for four minutes <laughs> and 33 <laughs> seconds. Okay. And so just like the porcelain urinal, it was like, well, wait a minute. Is that music? And Cage was saying to us, there's never silence. That in that 433, there isn't silence. I mean, just even here, I, I can hear someone on Dorset driving down the street, probably too fast over the speed limit. <laughs> um, you know, or if we were quieter longer, we might hear the kids next door. Anyway, so that was Cage's point. I can say an additional thing about there is no silence. Oh, sorry, microphone. Uh, just to add to that, because it's a very interesting point and part of this whole Fluxus movement, 
which is the researcher scientists have tried to test is there such thing as silence so at harvard university they built this large antiotic chamber which is completely silent like deep in the ground full of dirt on top of it completely isolated from the world and john cage went into the chamber and sat there for a while and when he came out the scientist asked did you hear anything and he said yes i could hear two things one was really low and one was really high really low pitch really high pitch does anyone have a guess what those two things would be absolutely it was his blood flow <laughs> and his nervous system so even when we are uh, in silence, our bodies are still making noise. Great, yep, yep. So 1958, Cage decides he's gonna teach a class at the New School, and it's called Composition as Process. And of course, he was dealing with this thing that anything can be music, and silence is part of the, our world. He also uh, had been studying with Suzuki Roshi at Columbia University, who was I think the first Zen priest to come over to the, at least in New York, and Cage was very taken with the, the concept of nowness. Just be fully present now. Don't worry about what's coming and don't, you know, whatever's already gone is gone and stuff. So he was encouraging these students to think about this thing of the silence and the void, the thing of no authorship, the thing of absolutely right now be present, and he also became interested in the I Ching, where you throw these things and it determines a, a plan of action. So Cage, in his own compositions, would compose these pieces, and then he would throw the I Ching, and he would rearrange the way that he thought they were going to be. Or he would give you the score, and he would have you throw the I Ching, and you could, you could rearrange the com composition how you want it. And he was saying, is that a John Cage composition, or is that your composition? And does it matter? And does it matter at all? So what he was talking to these folks about is like he was questioning the importance of an artist and the importance of the final art prod product is what he was questioning. So people in this class, it was 58, uh, got really jazzed up. And, and Yoko Ono, who you may know was married to John Lennon, but her previous husband before that was in, in one of Cage's classes. And so he became a big acolyte of this whole thing. And so they started hosting in their loft on Chamber Street these weekend concerts that were very much like Dada events, where they invited all these people who maybe were composers or maybe they weren't composers, but they were poets. And they were all trying to just deconstruct everything and change everything. Someone else in the class had the first happenings, which were these immersive environments where uh, Alan Caprow was his name, where people would come in to a loft, and maybe some of you have been at a happening, but, and it was immersive. You didn't know where to look. There was no audience, and there wasn't any event happening. You would see someone cooking in the kitchen, and was that part of the event, or was that because you're in someone's loft house? <laughs> or, you know, or you'd hear people talking in the tub, in the bathroom or something. So it was all about what's the audience, and who defines what the work is? And the, the artist isn't defining it for you. So there was that happening. And then there was a man by the name George Machunas, who was very uh, interested in this. And he had been to Yoko Ono's loft. And he opened a gallery called the AG Gallery in 1960. And he did what he called Neo Dada events, which were all these people from Cage's class doing these objects, doing the sound, doing all these, the, these very different things. Machunas is a very interesting character in New York because back then, Soho, which is the fancy part of the art district now, was all these abandoned places. So George Machunas decided that he was going to have artists move into these spaces. And he actually worked on 17 different artist lofts. So it, it, that is really his contribution that he did this because as a business person, he was completely terrible. He kept everything he tried was bankrupt. So the gallery is bankrupt, but he was working then for the United States government in the, in the military in uh, Wiesbaden, Germany. 
and he decided in 1962 that he was going to start a magazine, and he was going to call it Fluxus. And Fluxus was going to be this neo-Dada performance group of people that were completely renegades, completely changing, upending the rules. And so he invited a few friends from New York and from Germany to come and perform a Fluxus event. It was going to be a Fluxus festival to raise money for a Fluxus magazine that he wanted. And so we're going to show you from 1972, this is only a, like a four minute clip of that very first Fluxus festival. Okay? It's in German, but you won't need to know what they're saying. <laughs> It'll be clear. So people were coming to a concert hall thinking they were going to see some experimental music or something. So that's Alison Knowles, and 30 years later the Berkeley Art Museum has a retrospective of her work. Dick Higgins, Benjamin Patterson, Emmett Williams. So they have uh, on their little adding tapes there actions that they're going to do in order, but not how to do them, just what the action is. And Sean and I are going to explain that later. That's Namjoon Pike. So everyday sounds. That's George Machunas with the glass. So finally the audience relaxes because they realize they're like pranksters. That is, they're so Ben Patterson it was uh, interesting. He was a classical musician. And then when John Cage came along, he changed the way he thought about music. And those of you who know Cage did pieces for prepared pianos, where he put screws and things underneath the, the piano strings, and then he would play it to make it sound different. So Ben decided he would up the ante on John Cage a little bit here. So often they have performance idea scores, and one was from Lamont Young that said, draw a line and follow it. So this is Nam June Pike doing what Lamont Young suggested and draw a line and follow it in Nam June Pike's way. Man beachte den musikalischen Hinterkopf. 
So, I mean, Namjoon Mike went on to be very famous, and there's a great PBS documentary on him for his video work. But this is interesting because this is the kind of things they did, and how do museums collect it, and what are they collecting? And so a museum actually owns that piece that he dragged us, but is that, it's just a remnant of the thing. The video is almost more telling than the object itself. And that was the point that they were trying to do, is the action versus the result. And here they um, got in a lot of trouble uh, with the, the music hall that they had rented that evening. And they uh, destroy a piano. Piano activities nennt sich diese Komposition. Es war einmal ein Flügel. Sollten andere Städte eifersüchtig werden, gemach, die Dada Musiker gehen auf Tournee. Anyway, they carry it out and that's the end of the concert. So, uh, so this, th they did two or three more dates in Europe and then suddenly there was now a fluxus movement. Even though there wasn't a fluxus movement before, it was these artists doing different things. But what was interesting is there were artists from Europe there, there were artists in New York there, and the artists from Japan were there, uh, Namjoon Pike, uh, Korean, and they all went back to their places and used this ethos of you take these performance scores, you can do it any way you want, it doesn't matter who does it, and it doesn't matter what it looks like, it's the intent of the artist and it kind of do a process thing. So, but, so suddenly the, the people were saying, oh, there is a fluxus movement. Um, and it was these scores, it was this non-ego attachment. Like you couldn't, if you did a score like Lamont Young, draw a line and follow, you couldn't own the outcome because someone was gonna do it in their way. And so what, what was important? They were task-oriented, improvisatory, um, they were often intermediate, what they called, uh, because sometimes they, they did video works. There were some really interesting, um, uh, we'll talk about some of those later. Um, and it was playful, okay? It was all very playful. So one of the event scores that, that was at this, the person didn't come, but George Brecht did a score. And his piece was called Drip Music. And the score just said, for a single or multiple performance, a source of dripping water and an empty vessel are arranged so that the water falls into the vessel. That's all it said. So anyone could do it any way they wanted to. So Namjoon Pike, who was sort of a, a bad boy back then, uh, stood in a tub and took a bucket of water and poured it over him. And that was his version of George Brecht's drip music. Our buddy Sean here is on the ladder here in the church, and he's going to do his version of drip music, George Brecht's drip music. Yoko Ono had a score that she said, um, light a match and watch till it goes out. So she actually made a film on this where it was just, a, the camera, it was all in slow motion, the camera was just on the match until it went out. And, and that was Yoko's score. So um, I mentioned the Lamont Young one of draw a line and follow it. And then, Alison Knowles, 
who um, was the, the first woman to walk uh, on stage in, um, in Germany, she, she has this retrospective uh, at Berkeley Art Museum this year, uh, about 60 years of her art making. It. So she, but back then, one of her uh, studio mates said, you know, Allison, you eat the same thing every single day for lunch. And she said, really? And he says, yeah, you have a tuna fish sandwich. And, and she said, oh, yeah, I like tuna fish. And, but he, but her, her friend said, no, no, you have a tuna fish sandwich on wheat toast with lettuce and butter, no mayo, every day. Whether you have it in the studio or if you go downstairs to the deli, you order the same thing. So Allison said, okay, well, that's a good idea. What I'll do is invite, for a year, I'll invite friends to join me. And come to the studio or meet me at the deli and have a tuna fish sandwich and wheat toast with lettuce and butter, no mayo. Okay? You made it already? I forgot the lettuce. You forgot the lettuce! <laughs> well, this is what happens in fluxes. Okay? So, uh, so what Allison did is she did this. We did it. And she took photographs of people doing this, and you can see, see them in there for one year. And what she did is she took notes on where we were. So if we were Allison Knowles, we'd be talking about we were here today at this, and we were doing this in front of people. And that became her art project. Now what she did is, friends in Germany, she invited them not to come to New York, but to do it at the same time. So at noon my time, I'm going to be eating a tuna fish sandwich and wheat toast with lettuce and butter, no mayo, and why don't you join me? <laughs> so Allison knows it was less about eating, obviously, but it was about coming together, being intentional, sharing space, and what that means for, for her. Uh, she's, she's done amazing pieces. She was raising kids, too, and so food was an issue. Um, the, for the family, and she did one called Make a Salad, and that would be the score. And so you could make a fruit salad if you wanted, you could make any kind of salad. Um, but in, she had a retrospective at the, the, um, in Los Angeles Disney Hall, which is the Philharmonic Hall, in 2019. They had a Make a Salad celebration for Allison Knowles, where there were 50 people on stage, all mic'd, chopping up the salad, and the audience was listening and watching. <laughs> and then afterwards, people were invited to come up and, like a cafeteria, come on the stage, get some salad, and then eat together. And so was the point, being in Disney Hall, was the point watching this, or was the point eating together? Uh, you know, Allison so Knowles would say, it, it, it's, it's all of this. So people, it's less of a movement, really, because people kept coming in and out of these festivals uh, when they were happening. Uh, Leggetti, who wrote the music for 2001 Space Odyssey, remember that? Great, wonderful, weird music, beautiful. Well, he did a piece at a, a festival where he had 100 metronomes on stage, and people turned them on, <laughs> and the piece ended when the last metronome stopped. That it was there was, that was Ligeti's piece. <laughs> Joseph Boyce, a wonderful conceptual artist, he did a piece where he had a toy orchestra, wound it up, and he sat at a table like this and watched it. <laughs> and then bowed and walked off the stage. <laughs> um, Yoko Ono, who, there's a really interesting right now in Japan Society in New York, an exhibition of four Japanese women in, in the Fluxus movement that just opened last week. They're a great review of it in New York Times. Yoko Ono was one of them. Um, she did a, a piece in 64 in London called Cut Piece. I don't know if people know that piece where she actually knelt on stage and she had a scissors there and invited the audience to come and cut her clothes. And it was a really radical act, if you think about it, of a woman being that exposed and open to have that happen and fragile, but also claiming her own agency. One of the other Japanese women of the time who was in this movement, uh, Shigeko Kubata, did a piece called Vagina Painting, which blew everyone's minds when it happened, but is really considered a 
really seminal piece of feminist art where she literally squatted over a paint, uh, a canvas, and she had the paintbrush in her vagina and she painted like that. She claimed her own agency in a very radical way. This is the 60s, okay? We're talking about the 60s. Um, let's see. Ben Boitier was a French fluxus guy, and he decided that the signature, like Duchamp, the signature meant everything. So he would take a found wine bottle and he'd sign his name to it, and then he'd say, okay, now it's art because <laughs> I signed it. Uh, he lived in a storefront gallery for a week. And if you think about it, many artists have done that subsequent. Have they lived in galleries and stuff? But he was, I think, one of the first ones that it was the everyday action. And was it the artist or was it the audience who was looking at this person in the gallery doing this? I mean, what, what, was, what was the art here? Um, Dick Higgins, who lived in West Glover, Vermont, uh, a wonderful guy. He was married to Allison Knowles for a while with their kids. And he was, he was at Wiesbaden too. But he talked about that it was really, a Fluxus to him was not a movement, it was a way of doing things. And he, he said, okay, you've seen it, now it's yours, do what you want. That, that was part of it. Um, one of the other Japanese women, Mieko Shiomi, talked about it as pragmatic consciousness. That she th sees things differently in everyday life after performing or seeing these works. So Machunas, this, this guy who was the organizer of the festivals, he was trying to organize this as a movement. And so he was doing a lot of, he was a graphic designer. And so he was doing a lot of logos. And um, they had these boxes that he'd, he'd have each of these people send me something. And I'll put it in a box and there'd be a collection of just found objects, basically. And then they would sell them at the Fluxus store. Well, in the year the Fluxus store was there, no one bought anything. It was, <laughs> it was another one of George. But these Fluxus boxes are worth a lot of money. It's kind of amazing. Um, and we have a collector in Vermont um, who has 700 Fluxus pieces. Um, so they, these things, you know, there were chess sets. Um, there were, uh, they tried to do different pamphlets, and nothing really worked. Um, the, the, um, they also started making films. I mentioned the one about Yoko doing the, the match. Um, she did one called Blink, which you guess it's a close-up of an eye opening and closing. <laughs> one called Smile. But it was these everyday actions, right? Not glamorized, but just done as they are done, and for the audience then to respond to them in the way they want to. Um, the same time there was, uh, Namjoon Pike did a piece called Zen for Film, and it was just running clear leader for seven minutes. And of course, it was, it was filmed, so every time you did it, the, 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 the sock got scratched and dirtier. So <laughs> it degraded over time, and that's exactly what Namjoon Pike wanted, is for this object of film that had nothing on it to degrade. Um, they were sending postcards to each other. There's a 91-year-old Fluxus artist in Brattleboro that's, um, I've gotten to know, uh, Nye Therabis is her name, and she and Yoko Ono used to, they raised their kids together, they'd be in the Central Park with the kids. But Yoko would send her a postcard that was half finished, and then she would send it back to, back to Yoko, and there was a guy na named Ray Johnson who would do these mail art, it was called, and he would say, Add on to it and you send it on to anyone you want. Or you could hoard it and keep it. Or you could send it on or you could, and, and so it was hard to understand when, when Ray died about, well, is this a postcard started by him, but is it a Ray Johnson postcard if you've taken it and you've drawn on it and then you've sent it along? Like, what's the ownership here? And that's exactly what some of these folks were thinking about. Um, the Nytherabis I mentioned, she and her husband, Jeff Hendricks, they'd been married for 10 years, and uh, they decided um, that they had two kids. They decided they were going to separate. Um, still, you know, they kept the kids um, and, and family, but they weren't going to live together anymore. So they decided they'd have a flux divorce, because of course they had to have a, a fluxus event. So they invited everyone to come to their house, and they had taken barbed wire, and they put it down the middle of the hall, 
and the men were to go on one side of the barbed wire and the women would go on the other side. They had taken a saw and they chopped up their bed and they had ripped up their um, marriage certificate into shreds and then the kids had sewn mom and dad back to back in coats. And the men, the men were asked to um, pull on the male side and the women were asked to pull on the female side until they ripped apart um, at the coats. And then that was the end of the party and Jill Johnston, who was a critic for New York, uh, for the Village Voice, was playing piano. Louise Nevelson was there. John Lennon, Yoko Ono, they, all the party. Everyone was having a good time. And the Museum of Modern Art in New York does have something called the Flux Divorce Box, <laughs> which is remnants of, of these kinds of actions, um, which, you know, it, it's hard to understand how they do. So. Um, I mentioned Nye lives in Brattleboro. Dick Higgins was uh, West Glover. Allison Knowles uh, went to Middlebury. And um, so there is an amazing collection of fluxes, stuff that's happened here in Vermont that, that we're uncovering. Um, if you think about Andy Warhol's films, um, and, and this is why fluxes is interesting to me, is that most of us don't remember any of their names, but they so were in, in, they influenced the next generation. So Andy Warhol's films were very much influenced by Fluxus. He would hang out with these people when he was a young artist in New York. And if you think about, Andy Warhol made a film called Sleep, which was nine hours long. The camera was just on someone sleeping, right? <laughs> so, but that was very Fluxus-like, right? He also did these, um, Things where at, when people would come to his studio, the factory, he would sit down and say, okay, well, we're going to do a, a, what would he call it, an audition tape, I guess it was, uh, a, screen, a screen test. He called them screen tests. And he said, just sit there, and I'll turn the camera on for two minutes with no instructions. <laughs> and then he'd say, thank you. And then he would say, okay, <laughs> now we'll sit in the camera for two minutes, no instructions. So he has hundreds of these things, and some of them are very famous people who came down there. And, with no, and so some were hamming it up, some were silent. Lou Reed was sitting there smoking a cigarette. He wasn't sure what he was supposed to be doing. Um, so, but it's like, so Warhol, and then of course Warhol took pop art, you know, uh, with a number of other artists, but this is the next generation after Fluxus. And they, like the brittle, uh, Brillo pads or the, soup cans were totally influenced by these folks. Take everyday objects and reproduce them in a different way. And so those artists brought it to scale, what they're talking about. So we're, we're going to see, uh, some of you may have seen it last week on, on PBS, uh, a video I made. But when I started doing this research, I, um, I really love Sean as a person, and I love his work as an artist, a beautiful sound composition person. And um, I was thinking I wanted him to make the sound score for this Fluxus piece, even though it wasn't created yet. I just wanted to work with him. And so I have a Shetland pony at a barn in Williston uh, that I hitch up to a cart and drive around. And um, So I was, I was sitting there one day, and Sean shows up with his two kids because it was pony camp time. So, so anyway, he dropped the girls off. They were with the horses. I sat under the tree and I said, Sean, I have this idea. So I'll turn it over to you now, Sean. Well, John said, I have this idea. Have you ever heard of Fluxus before? And I had to chuckle a little bit because I had, but not intentionally. When Many years ago, I was an undergraduate at the University of New Mexico, and I was maybe not doing so well in a music composition class that I was in. So the professor said, well, if you want some extra credit, you got to volunteer for this theatrical production that was happening. So needing the extra credit, I did. And after volunteering for the theatrical production, the director came up and said, well, I can't pay you, but I can give you some CDs. And I thought, all right, great, I'll take whatever. Uh, and he had this collection of CDs, one of which was by Allison Knowles, who John was talking about, who made the, 
the sandwich piece and the salad piece. I had never heard of Allison Knowles, but there was something about the, the CD that really resonated with me. And all it was, uh, it's called Friole's Canyon, and it was these recordings of her traveling through Friole's Canyon, which is in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, and doing field recordings of different people in the community making food with beans. I loved it so much that it became uh, a recording that I would listen to to, I don't know, help me get in the zone uh, because I was also a track athlete at the time. So I'd be at the track athlete and you know everyone would be warming up and I'd have my headphones on listening to Allison Knowles not knowing she was fluxus or anything about it. It wasn't until many years later. And I think when John asked that question, it was an instant uh, connection in many ways. That's great. Um, so, so well, it's 14 minutes. Um, well, we'll see it. And you'll actually see, I hope, that some of these scores that I mentioned of the water, drip music, draw a line and follow it, what I did is I took 12 of these artists who I really admire for the, the impact they've had and took some of their performance scores, but tried not to do it as they did it or anyone else did it. It's like, how could I do it in my own way in this, you know, 60 years afterward? So I, I'm not trying to be any of them, it's, but it's sort of an homage to this group of rascals. And then we'll take questions.
did, and she would always say beforehand, will I like it or will it be good for me? So <laughs> I hope some of you liked it and the rest of you, it's good for you, okay? If you don't like it. That anyway, was great. That really we're, we're, we're glad to answer questions. Oh, good. Okay, so any on Zoom? Not yet? Okay, come on, Zoomers. How about live here? Oh, okay. Martha. Thank you for your presentations. I, I was listening quite attentively. I, 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 it declined when I was looking at the part with the metronome and the, uh, what I thought was the Sara Lee cake box. But anyway, uh, the, one of the lines what, that one of you said was, but what's the ownership of the action as a central kind of a premise or a, a thrust? I don't know what word to use here for what you're thinking about. And, and I, I think, uh, you know, that I associated that with, with the line in Alice in Wonderland where the uh, Queen of Hearts says something to Alice like, uh, it's about a word. She says, well, when I use a word, it'll mean whatever I want it to mean. <laughs> There's nothing conventional about it, nothing, you know, patterned or normative about it. It's just, uh, I own that word. I'll, I'll make it whatever I want. It, it's completely, you know, uh, so it fosters an idiosyncratic, non-conventional, non-normative kind of reality, I, it seems to me. Now, my first big mistake, I guess, is to look for meaning. But, but uh, maybe that is the point, that everything is, that is what you want to make it. And uh, you know, I, there's a, a whole field of, of, of literature which I became very uh, fond of or, or used a lot. Uh, communication theory out of Palo Alto, California, there's people. Anyway, the, the idea that all behavior communicates, one cannot not communicate. And um, message communicated is not necessarily message received. And other kind of central premises around, it's just the way we're built. We're continually sending messages that have a kind of report part and also relationship and context built in. So uh, it's, this to me defies that. It, 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 it ends up sounding like the queen of hearts. I'll make this be action, this behavior mean anything I want it to mean. And, and, and uh, and, and so if you, if you tend to see something coming your way and you want to make sense out of it in the way you usually make sense out of it, which might be a little bit normative, uh, forget it. It's not going to mean that. It'll mean what I say it means. And so maybe you can help me with the philosophical underpinnings of this in, in about <laughs> 30 seconds, but I, I don't get it. You know, you got it. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I'm not being facetious. You totally got it. It's exactly that. I had, the last three weeks I was artist in residence at Champlain College. And Sean was an invited artist to create a piece. But 88 students made pieces inspired by Fluxus. And it was chaos. <laughs> it was great. It was awful. It was fantastic. It was banal. It was profound. It was stupid. At, but everyone got so excited about thinking of this, and in one of the design classes, uh, I, I d d presented my notes to them, and this, this, th the kids were wearing masks, and this, this one Japanese uh, man was like, he looked like he was unhappy, and I said, well, I said, so I think you have feelings about this. What do you think? And he says, I think this is just stupid. <laughs> and he said, and our class has, we have an assignment. We have to do a poster about something we care about in the flux of style, and how am I going to do that? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I don't know. But if you think about everyday objects, and what does that mean to you? And I was so happy when he brought his poster. He decided he wanted to do something about creating empathy for those who are unhoused. That was his, and he took all of his clothes or all of his belongings and put them in a shopping cart. And it was really interesting that he took ownership of the idea that he wanted to do something, someone who was unhoused, and he took his objects and made it an art piece. And I said to him afterwards, I said, you know, I knew when you called it stupid that you were really going to come up with something really good. <laughs> <laughs> and you did. And he said, yeah, I like this piece. So. Um, 
anyway. What feelings do you end up with after you've gone through this? That you've created something? Or that you haven't? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, you know, th that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, th th this was my 17th film, and so uh, I'm just going to stand so I can see you. It, you know, every film I make is like I don't really know why I made it and what, what its purpose is in the world. And this one in particular, I had no idea. I just wanted to do this, and I was, um, had uh, applied to the Arts Council and got turned down, and so I found other resources to make it. And then I thought, well, what is it? And when friends would look at it, they're like, okay, John, what is it? Um, and it was a year to the day that um, we, I shot that in downstairs in Flint space for those who know, know the downstairs space. It aired on Vermont PBS. And, uh, you know, we were artists in residence at Champlain. So um, I didn't know what its purpose was when I made it. Uh, I just made a new piece about living with chronic pain, and I have no idea where that, what that will be, you know. And so uh, I just wanted to delve into the process of, I needed like a restart after COVID. And I had run the Flint for eight years. I was in the Vermont legislature. I was not going to run again. And I needed a restart, and I thought, Fluxes is going to be my restart, where I just think about things and take everyday objects and work on the process of something and not worry about what the outcome's gonna be. So um, we shot it in one take. There were three cameras there, so it was very stressful because the lights were there, the sound was there, and the three cameras were there. So I just wasn't sort of, you know, and we only did one take on it, so I couldn't screw it up. So I was nervous during it. Um, and then we edited it, and then I t turned it over to Sean and, and said, okay, now, you have to create the pulse of the piece with, with this sound score. So uh, I don't know why I made it. And, <laughs> um, but, you know, being at the Open Edge Champlain College and seeing the 88 kids really happy and doing just wild things like kids in college should be doing in art classes, um, and esteemed artists like Sean were part of it as well. There were 108 pieces in this show. It was all about celebrating this moment where artists just kind of reinvented themselves. Um, so that's why I made it. I think it was probably for that, and I didn't know that. <laughs> we have one time for one more question. That's it. Here's one from Zoom. Nice to know more about what was happening in the 60s. <laughs> Is anyone new following this now? You sort of answered. Is anyone new following Fluxus now? Um, uh, is that working? Yes. Um, uh, is anyone new following it now? Uh, like youth, perhaps? Or I mean, I loved uh, John's um, mention of uh, the students at Champlain College because I'm a professor too. At, in Johnson, uh, which is a whole other thing that we don't have time to get into, but um, but um, the younger generations that I see really need fluxus in their lives, and here's one big reason why: is that I'm seeing so many students that have grown up in this system um, where everything is so scheduled, everything is so directed. Everything has to have a purpose. And like their schedules coming out of high school or, you know, everything's so tight. And I know this too, being a parent, it's like you're running around all the time and you always have to get to the next thing. But there's very little time for reflection. There's very little time for experimentation and there's very little time for play. And when, when I see these students getting into college and when I see them trying to emulate some of the ideas that John's bringing about with the, the fluxus, it's very challenging for them. It's really like switching a, a different pattern and a different gear. So uh, I think that there's a lot of room 
in our world right now for this kind of remodeling the, the kind of systems that especially the youth have um, really have had very little chance, uh, little um, uh, opportunity to, to change. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question because m many of these artists aren't remembered. And so, like, Sean knew Allison from him being in the zone before his track meet and didn't realize that it was these beans being shaken in a bag with field recordings. But so Sean's music in this piece is very Fluxus-like, even though he would never think he was a Fluxus person. But it's these subsequent generations that may not know about them. Wiley Garcia, who is the curator at Champlain College, she had, didn't know about Alice and Olds at all. And she said, oh, you know, this is interesting as you talk about this, John, because I did a piece in uh, 2018 where I had handed cards out and invite, invited people to come to my house at Sunday from 1 to 3 and have tea and cookies. And every Sunday I was there, and sometimes people would show up, and some didn't. And she said, I guess that was inspired by Alison Knowles, even though I didn't know it, right? <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, m maybe, but that this group really allowed conceptual art to happen, performance art to happen, body arts. You know, there's, this is with these, these Yoko and Shigeko. These, these women were, were really radical in what they were doing and allowed other women to, to do claim their own body as well. So they're not as remembered as well, but they, there's, you know how, all, all change happens from the fringe, right? We see that in our politics today. I certainly learned that in the Vermont House. The, the left and the right may not mainstream, but their ideas push the center, right? Well, the same thing happens. These artists never mainstream, but they actually push the center. And, you know, Yoko Ono, um, I mean, she is a very famous person, of course, but she put out this book in 1964 called Grapefruit, right? And these were performance scores, like we've been talking about. Every day there was a different one. Well, you know the song Imagine? That was 1971. John Lennon took sole credit for writing. Even though there are Imagine lyrics in the 1964 book of Yoko Ono, <laughs> okay, <laughs> the performance scores. So eventually John Lennon had to admit it was co-written by Yoko Ono and inspired by her, of course. But again, Yoko was never going to mainstream in the way John Lennon mainstreamed, but she allowed the John Lennons to change. And so um, I, I, to our Zoom listener, uh, I, th I think this has been a very influential group, even though this generation has very little idea of who they were. John and Sean, thank you so much for bringing Fluxus to Triple E.